honour to be here today. Um, my family were born in Wales. My mother was born in um, Mountain Ash. My father in Swansea. Um, and to be here today um, with you is uh, a real treat for me. I suppose my journey sort of really started with Do through a connection with David Hyatt. Um, I worked with David um, at Saatchi's in the mid-80s, in the, in the heyday of advertising. Um, I think David and I also worked together again um, towards the end of the 90s on some dot-com business. And I went along to the Do lectures two years ago as a guest. And I must say that the people I met there have been really important in getting me to this talk today. Uh, in fact, there's about five people that I see pretty regularly every two or three months that were either talk, uh, uh, speakers at, uh, at the do or, or people that I met. Um, my talk is going to have probably like three sort of parts to it. The first part, I think, is going to be my story about being an alcoholic ad man and then turning into a yogi. I think my wife calls that the story of... Um, or well, the journey of being off my head to on my head. <laughs> the second um, story is probably going to be about a thing I like to call well-doing. And well-doing was something that really came out of my own journey uh, into understanding how we can actually do really cool stuff but stay sane on the way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then the sort of third part will be about... <laughs> Uh, a breathing app that I've created with an old school friend of mine called BreatheSync, um, which will really bring in this idea of breathing yourself better. Um, and that means breathing yourself better as a physical and mental thing, but also enabling you to go and do really cool things. So I'd better move on, otherwise I'll run out of time. So hopefully this will work. Um, so the journey really started for me um, in my, my time in advertising. Um, in the 80s um, it was a time when uh, we had a hell of a lot of fun um, and we, we really did know how to do one thing very, very well, and that was drink. <laughs> um, we used to have a tea lady at Saatchi's that used to come along on Friday afternoons at 4 o'clock um, with a little trolley, and rather than being full of uh, an urn of tea, would be full of bottles of L'Anson champagne. <laughs> I can see someone smiling who was there at the time. Uh, and would literally be saying, does anyone want a bottle of champagne? And we just helped ourselves and drank it out of the bottle. We couldn't be bothered with glasses. Um, and so it was, it was a fun time, a great time, but, but alcohol became a, a problem for me. Um, and I drank my way through the 80s and 90s, and then... Um, uh, my girlfriend at the time was pregnant, and I was given uh, my first ultimatum, uh, which was, do you want to be the father of this child or, or not? And I thought, you know, I didn't want to be a drunk dad. Um, and so I stopped drinking uh, nearly 20 years ago. So tw about 20 years this November, I've been sober. Um, and so... That was a difficult journey because what I realized, when you, when you have an addiction problem, um, it sort of really takes over in a way that means that you don't really think about much else. And when you don't have it to rely on, things like the stress of life become even more um, difficult to deal with. Um, so I was living this life in advertising um, a successful life. I was sort of director of creative services at a big American agency. And on the morning of November the 2nd, 1998, um, I got a phone call um, in, in my nice office um, in this ad agency that my brother Jonathan, who was um, only 31, had fallen from his 15th floor balcony in Kuala Lumpur. And this is actually... Um, Kuala Lumpur behind us, um, and he had an apartment just around the corner from the Petronas Towers, the um, tallest building in the world at the time. And so he'd fallen 15 floors and died on impact. And I was sitting there in my office, um, emotionally distraught, breaking down, as you, as, as you would expect, um, questioning what I was doing. And at the same time, 
I had this really weird inner experience of like a rod of iron going up my spine that I could do whatever needed to be done. So I was breaking down emotionally, but I felt this inner strength that actually I could um, fly out to Kuala Lumpur, sort out his affairs, um, tell my father that his son had died. And um, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, um, his friends wanted to take me out um, to his favorite bar, which was called Marley's in Kuala Lumpur. And when we were there, um, they put on his favorite song. And his favorite song was Every Breath You Take. <laughs> and I remember um, being on the dance floor there, tears streaming down my face, Every Breath You Take playing, um, which is funny considering what I'm now talking about. Um, I only just realized that, I think, at 3 o'clock this morning when I woke up yet again. Um, so the reason why there's a sort of play button on the screen here is this was my, this was my time of uh, obsessive doing. I was great at doing. I was great at getting things done. I was in production. I was um, uh, the, uh, the cat herder, as, as we were called at the time. I was organizing creative people. I was great at getting things done, but, but I was pretty stressed, and I was in a pretty bad way. And when my brother um, died, I went into a period of realizing that this is not what I wanted to do with my life. But because of my addiction, I really didn't have a clue what else to do. When people said, well, what do you really love doing? What's your passion? I didn't have one. Um, so I went through a period of really not knowing. And I think it's important when you are lost and you don't know to admit that you don't know. Because all too often when we don't know, we, we see something because it's uncomfortable to not know. And I really had no idea what to do, but I knew that I couldn't carry on doing what I was doing. So press pause. Um, in the do lectures, we talk about ideas and energy equals change, but also tragedy causes change. And when I was in this place of not knowing, I'd started doing yoga as a, as a way of dealing with stress and depression and grief. And, and it, was, it was a great thing to do. It really helped me. But it wasn't something that I thought I'd actually end up doing as a career. And it only really happened when I was on an alternative family holiday at a community in Dorset called Moncton Wild. And Moncton Wild was a little bit like this in a way. It's a big old, big old priory type of building that was a school in the, in the 70s, an alternative school, that was closed down by the um, uh, local education authorities because... They were taking drugs, I think. <laughs> um, but the teachers stayed on and turned it into an educational trust, and it's still an edu educational trust to this day. And I was there on this alternative family week where we did you know, crazy things, and they had yoga classes, and that was one of the big pulls for me and my wife that we could actually um, leave the kids to do some things and we could go and do some yoga. And, and Prem, the, the, the yoga teacher, didn't turn up to um, one of the classes. And I was there with three women saying, oh, that's a real pain. We want to do some yoga. And, and some voice in me said, hey, I could teach you some yoga. I've been doing a little bit of yoga. I'm not a teacher, but why don't I have, have a go? And I walked into this space, and I laid down the yoga mats, and I lit a candle, and I lit some incense, and I had an epiphany. I had a moment of thinking, wow, this is what I want to do. This, I, I love this. Immediately afterwards, I had my rational brain kicked in going, what do you mean? You've got a big mortgage, you've got two young children. You, know, you can't give that up and become a yoga teacher. But my heart had been pulled in a way that I couldn't say no to. And I became a yoga teacher. In fact, when I did my yoga teacher training, I was involved in a management buyout from a, a tech business that, that I was working at. And, and if that had gone through, maybe I wouldn't have become the yoga teacher. But it failed, as a lot of them did in the early 2000s. And I started teaching yoga. And I've been teaching yoga now for 12 years. Um, I teach classes to the public. I teach to companies. I teach at the Tate Britain, as Mark said. I teach at the National Portrait Gallery. I also run workshops. I run retreats. And um, I've also developed mindfulness courses as well um, that um, have extended um, the work that I do. At the same time, the sort of second phase of, of this story was that I'd got into what I call obsessive being. 
So I'd gone from obsessive doing in advertising to obsessive being. I was a yogi, I was meditating, I was doing lots of yoga, I was doing what I loved. But at the same time, I wanted to do stuff. And I realized I'd lost the knack of doing things. I, I was an institutional doer. So in, 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 a, in a company, when people are nagging you and asking you for status reports and going to meetings, I was greatly getting stuff done. But on my own, I didn't know what to do. So I googled how to get things done. I ended up finding a book called Get Things Done, which um, uh, by the wonderful David Allen, who's also spoken at Do Lectures. And I got totally into this, because the first page of the book talks about having a mind like water. And this is what we look for in yoga and, and mindfulness, to have a still, clear mind. And I'd never thought that that could also come from being better organized. So I started working on these two things together, getting things done, stilling the mind, and also working on my well-being at the same time. And I call that well-doing. Well um, because there's almost like two tribes in the world. There's the, the, the beings who talk about us being human beings, not human doings. And then there's the doers who say, it's what, what you do that matters, it's not who you are. Um, and the truth is, we're both human beings and human doings. And, and well-doing is my attempt personally to, to bring that to my life, and then through some coaching work that I do to do that with other people, with the purpose of helping people that do good to do it better. And in this process of, of, of moving things forwards in my life, I met up with Simon, uh, an old school friend who I hadn't seen for 25 years. And we both had a love of, of breathing. I understood breathing through my work in yoga as a great way to manage stress and to ma manage awareness and attention. Simon had come, up, come at it from a more uh, scientific background. He worked at the BBC in Phillips. And he was, very, he was one of the world's best signal processing engineers um, and understood how to analyze the heart to get a good measure of your stress. And he was doing a technique called coherent breathing, where you breathe in rhythm with your heart, and he was absolutely amazed by the results. So we, so we, we met up and we thought, well, you know, why don't we start doing something together as a way of keeping our friendship going, rather than just sort of saying we'll meet for a coffee once a month. Well, let's, let's have regular Skype calls as well as meeting for coffee and see if we can do something cool together. So three years ago, we started working on an app that could help you breathe yourself better. Um, <laughs> and we wanted the best breathing guru we could find. And the best breathing guru you can ever find is a baby. Because babies know how to breathe well. They're, they're naturally good breathers. They haven't lost the knack. And the knack is quite simple. I, I talk about the three keys to breathing well. The first one is breathe from your belly. The second one is breathe in and out through your nose. And the third one is breathe out more than you breathe in. And the reasons for this are when you're breathing from your belly, when you breathe from your belly, you can control your breath in a way. When you're breathing through your nose, the hairs in your nose clean the dust particles. There's a little chamber behind the nose that warms the air to the right temperature. And when you breathe out more than you breathe in, you trigger the body's natural relaxation response. So, we, th we thought we're going to work with the best breathing guru in the world. We're going to work with a baby. And then Simon said, well, yeah, but what else can we do? So we thought we'd look into the science. And the science that we looked into was a thing called heart rate variability. And this is where you manage the sort of beat-to-beat -beat variations in the heart to get an idea of stress. And this was first used by um, the Russians on their space program with Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. And they, they, they tracked his stress levels, um, measuring heart rate variability. Um, so we thought, if we can bring together this leading sort of science on stress and also the natural breathing of a baby, maybe we'd have something pretty cool to share with the world. And to understand, before I do a, a demo of the app together, um, how it works, is this idea of heart rate variability is a very difficult thing to explain. So I'll try and do it with some clapping <laughs> or maybe clicking my fingers. Um, most people think that your heart beats in a regular way. And the more regular it is, the more healthy you are. But the truth is, a healthy heart gets faster and slower. It gets faster and slower. And what's happening is as it gets faster, it's because your sympathetic nervous system is kicking in as it gets slower, your parasympathetic, your stress response and your relaxation response. 
So heart um, rhythm is much more interesting than just your heart rate. And if you can get your breathing in sync with your heart rhythm, what we call coherent breathing, you can actually increase your ability to deal with stress. You can improve your resilience. And when you think what a problem stress is in the world, that's pretty cool. Stress is behind cardiovascular disease, the biggest killer in the world. It's behind depression, the number one reason people go to doctors. Stress is behind obesity. It causes you to eat things you, 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 don't, you shouldn't be eating. It causes you to buy things that you don't need. Stress is probably the biggest problem that the world faces. And breathing is the most effective way of managing stress. So for me, it seemed ridiculous that people don't know how to breathe well. And if we can create a cool breathing app that helps people to breathe and be more mindful of their breathing, manage their stress levels, then that's a thing worth doing. So we created BreatheSync. BreatheSync is a biofeedback breathing app. It picks up your heartbeat by putting your finger over the camera lens. So it picks up the color change in your finger as your heart's beating. It analyzes your heart rhythm. And then it, then it tells you when to breathe in and out so that you're breathing in rhythm with your heart. So it's actually responding to your own physiology. And then at the end of a session, it gives you a reading that we call WQ. And WQ is like IQ for intelligence, but WQ is for wellness. And we took some research that was done in Denmark on different people of different ages, and we applied the mass behind IQ, so you get a reading of your WQ at the end of your breathing session. So you can use it with headphones on at the end of the day to relax and unwind, or you can use it before you go and do a talk like I did earlier, um, or you can just use it to track your wellness. And, and if your wellness scores are low, it means that you're stressed, you're tired, you need to do, do something about it. And you can track that, and that means that you're more likely to continue to, to, to use it. And you're training your breath. And when you, when you do this sort of work, the results aren't just while you're doing this breathing. It happens afterwards as well. It's a plastic effect. The research has shown if you do controlled deep breathing, you lower your blood pressure, you lower your levels of anxiety, and it's an effect that increases with time. So the idea I'm going to do now, and I, I haven't done this live on stage before, so let's hope it works, is to actually use this app now on myself. So it's going to be following my heart, and it's going to come up on screen with a breathing rhythm, and hopefully you're going to breathe along with me. That's the idea. And hopefully this will bring us into an entrained state, which is very similar to people singing in a choir. In fact, I think the BBC did a report not so long ago that when they were tracking people's heart rate variability while they're singing, they, they do become in sync with each other. Um, so I'm going to bring up the app now, we hope. And I'm just going to go and show you a little quick run-through of how it works. So we're going to, I'm going to put my finger over the camera lens. When the circles come up, these, these circles are going to come up. As they come up, I want you to breathe in. And as they go down, you're going to breathe out. Some of you might find it's quite slow. Sometimes there's pauses between the breaths as it's trying to get me in sync. So it can be difficult when you use it the first time. But try to follow it as best you can. And then we're going to get a score at the end, a WQ score. So being on stage and being filmed, I'm probably a little bit stressed. So it's probably not going to be that high. <laughs> Um, but maybe you can help me. So maybe if we do this together, we, we can actually get a, a, a good score. Um, there's a tracking screen here, so it shows you how often you're using it. It gives you an average score. And then you know, you, it's quite natural for it to go up and down. So you go up and down throughout the day, but there's a trend line that gives you an idea whether you're heading in the right direction or not. So um, I'm going to start the app now. I'm putting my finger over the camera. Um, hopefully the volume is up, and I'm going to start breathing in time. So when the, see the heart's beating at the top, it's picking up my pulse, breathing in as the circles go out, and then you're going to breathe out as the circles go down. Breathing from your belly, breathing in and out through your nose. You can close your eyes if you want and just follow the sounds.
six, not so bad. So 100 is about average. Um, to give you some idea, um, this morning when I woke up, I think I was about 50. Well, uh, actually, just before the talk, I got up to 108. I was 52 um, this morning. Um, so that's the first time we've, we, we've done that. Oh, we're back onto my screen here, so if you don't want to see that. Um, so the sounds there, interestingly enough, were created by um, a keyboard player um, called Jason Ribello, who actually was Sting's keyboard player. Um, and he told me a story about Every Breath You Take, which was the song I was listening to um, in Kuala Lumpur, which was that it's commonly used uh, at weddings and are used as a sort of sign of affection, but actually it's a song about a stalker. <laughs> um, so I'd like to say thank you for following my heart, um, and I wish you all the best in following yours. And this is two things I like to say when you're following your heart. One, start, and two, keep going. Thank you. <laughs>